Okay, we're ready to do our breakout report outs. So I think the first one we're going to do is business climate and competitiveness. It's the one that's up there. So are you doing it, Sandra? Yes. Can you? I got, I, I got a bandage. <laughs> so I'm making sure I can read our archives. Awesome. Do you want to go up there so you can flip it? or? I think I'll just stick right here. OK. I think I can see it all. Sorry? Do that. Sacrificial lamb here. <laughs> are we ready? Stephanie told me that I could tap on the mic if I needed to get everybody's attention, but don't make me do it. <laughs> I won't do it. Good afternoon. As we all wind down here, I got nominated to be the presenter for the first group. So I have a list here of who our people were, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to name them all. We'll just say that they were a boisterous group with a lot of opinions on the subject of business climate and competitiveness. For us, a couple of themes really quickly emerged. One of them was the needs of small business and under-resourced businesses and reaching out to them more effectively. One of them was uh, a really concerted effort to communicate more effectively. Um, we felt pretty strongly that there are a lot of resources in the community that are unrecognized and that business is largely unaware of at all levels. Uh, one of them was the availability of just something as simple as meeting space, just having places other than the coffee shop to meet. Uh, one of them was just the perception of this region, that there is a lag behind the way the region has developed and people's awareness of that, and that goes not only to prospective businesses coming into the area, but also with our own population being aware of the resources and the unique qualities that are available here. So even our, our own potential workforce doesn't recognize what's here. Uh, one of them is that there's a connect, disconnect excuse me, between the urban communities and the rural communities and getting the resources effectively to both places. And so often we found that the infrastructure is in place in one market and not in another, and that we need to be more effective about reaching that disconnect and correcting it. Um, one is, is the um, addressing our building codes, our land use codes, and making sure that it is compatible with concurrent use and making sure the technology in our local government offices is keeping pace uh, with the way the market is building and how our businesses need to communicate with us. Uh, and one of them is just making sure that the raw land that we are very rich in has the necessary infrastructure. So coming out of that, we had eight existing initiatives that we felt needed to be addressed. Um, these were already in the SETS plan and we, we supported them with some tweaking. The first uh, is that we establish a business navigator. All the business navigators in the room, raise your hand. <laughs> um, that, uh, or if you don't already have a business navigator or concierge, um, that you also work to provide a digital interface that allows businesses to get through the government paperwork more effectively. Uh, one is providing some forbearance on licensing and fees and local business tax receipts, helping businesses to get through that. Uh, and this is multifold. One is just the cost of it, but one of the other things that we uncovered is the inefficiency of it. You have to go to the health department, you have to go to the fire district, you have to go to the planning department, you have to go to the tax office. We're exhausted before we even started and then we're going to tell them there's fees. So again, for small business, a real challenge. Uh, action three, encouraging communication, collaboration, partnerships, and awareness between public and private sectors, really leveraging those partnerships in order to support the business community and create opportunity. Uh, the fourth, working with private industry, local, state, and federal partners to expand broadband services and affordability to support local and regional businesses, and this is increasingly a real issue. We found that the physical infrastructure needs can be mediated by improving our infrastructure on the technology front. Um, supporting economic development and diversification initiatives in rural communities, and this was important not just because of the disconnect between urban, urban and rural, but also that in terms of diversity, equity, inclusion, and access, so often the rural community is struggling in these areas. And this was an opportunity that we saw in the discussions this morning on workforce and education, and we saw it all the way down the pipeline. 
Um, so equitable success starting right there. Uh, action six, supporting local vendors and buying local so we can kind of streamline, uh, eliminate the bottlenecks, uh, address some of those infrastructure problems with getting the product to the market, uh, and, and building some local success into our local small businesses as well. Uh, number seven, working with private industry, local, state, and federal partners to facilitate providing access to capital. And this is especially true for startups, for small business, really understanding who small business is, um, looking at nonprofits and, and reaching that out throughout the region. Uh, action eight, working with local, state, and federal partners to increase the competitiveness of the region for contributory businesses and industries. And we also wanted to add an action nine, uh, that is encouraging the provision of meeting space for small business and, and really updating our inventory of what the resources out there are. Uh, and we recognize that in a post-pandemic world, ways to meet have changed, places to meet need to change too. There we go. is next. Looks like talent supply and education. Oops. Here's this question for that group. Talent supply and education. I don't know that you guys can even see these, can you? <laughs> it helps with the Good afternoon. SEDS member. SEDS member, yes, thank you. Good afternoon, I'm gonna move to the other side if you don't, well, I'll do it from here. Okay, so in our, our group, we looked at strengths first. Um, as far as quantity, we have all the trades and colleges and groups are focusing on education, work, and connection. So we also have a vertical alignment with curriculum. So K through 12, uh, post-secondary as well, career training, funding is there, um, but we need greater awareness, greater awareness of the opportunities that are in the educational arena for young persons. Uh, we have, um, again, under funding as another strength, because we do have Pell Grants and we have Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act dollars, or WIOA dollars. Um, there are some other grants that come up periodically through the state of Florida, so once again, it's about education and dissemination of information. Positive perception of the trades. We also think that's uh, going to be a strength. It's, uh, positivity is growing, but it's not complete yet. Um, again, we're focused on trades here. Uh, demand. Certainly it's growing. Growing population is creating uh, additional needs. And as you know, we have a, an aging population here in Southeast Florida. Uh, we have a lot of people moving into our area. They're looking for services and are going to be demanding those services from us. Public-private uh, partnerships. Um, the Maritime Academy, for instance, apprenticeships, local, state, federal, industry, um, and college boards. So we do see that we have a number of strengths that we can work on, uh, hopefully improving in the future. I get caught there. Sorry. Is, that's okay. It's left on done work, you know. <laughs> Weaknesses, exposure to CTE and technical needs. Uh, again, to occur at earlier grades. Uh, that's important for us. And we feel um, that, you know, in K-12, to there's not enough exposure for the young people to see that these are industries that are real. You know, if you ask a young person today, where do belt buckles come from? They probably couldn't answer that question. You know, are they made from, are they machined. So funding, lack of. 
uh, that's another weakness. And it was also a strength. So it depends on how you look at it and the requirements for the funding. Sometimes the requirements are too strict. You know, we have a very rigid program. And if you don't fall within the parameters of that program, you're excluded from the funding. But in this case, we're talking about infrastructure needs to be extended um, vertically, and we're talking about K all the way through. Um, but there are no in, uh, incentives for apprenticeship funding. Um, we need to have more incentives for apprenticeship funding. That's where we really need to see the dollars coming now because I'm training in HVAC and I'm going to look for a job, but I have no experience whatsoever. The employer is interested in me, but in his business, I would be a sole person in a truck. I've never had this job before, and you're going to take me right out of school and put me in a truck and send me out to work on HVAC. It's probably not going to happen. Um, so lack of differential pay, and a lot of people talked about that, but that is the expertise required to do the training. So in order to have a vocational school with excellent trainers, how are you going to get a person to come in and train at $20, $25 an hour when they can go out and make $85 an hour in the private industry? but we need an experienced vocational person to come in and train. So we need that differential pay to be examined. Funding for apprenticeships. Again, we talk about that, soft skills, and again, differential pay. Soft skills, funding, very important. Most employers today, if you ask them what is the number one need they have, soft skills. If you don't know what soft skills are, did you get up and go to work today? That's a soft skill. You know? Well, I was, well, you know, I looked outside and it looks real nice out, so I might not go. Well, we got to work on that. So, um, and, and frankly, that's not going to all come from home. Um, we have different family environments. We have different cultural environments. But the employer has one environment, and that's in their mind. So we need a way to translate that to the students so they fully understand. Because I've not met a child yet that if you set the boundaries, they usually don't go outside the boundaries. So let's try to help with soft skills, everybody. Um, not recognizing a workforce that exists. In other words, people with extra abilities. Some people call them disabilities. But those individuals, how about people who come from uh, their uh, had an ex-offender program. So we have workforce out there that we could tap into, but we have to find a way to make that work for us. Um, resources uh, to, let's try it from this side. Th thank you. I couldn't read the word, poverty. <laughs> That's it, resources for poverty-stricken areas. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, after school programs, care programs, um, you know, tutoring, et cetera. There's, there's so much need for all of that, and yet we just don't have enough funding in those areas. So what are the opportunities? In turn, let's look at investment in economically disadvantaged communities. That's the number one opportunity we have. Uh, it was pointed out to me because I brought up Palm Beach County where I currently reside, although I was a Martin County resident for many years. Um, but we have this disparity between the coast and the west in all these counties. And we need to recognize that. And so we need to invest economically in disadvantaged communities. There, some of them are on the east, but most are east-west. Um, training in automation. Um, okay, uh, open workforce based training. Uh, again, training in automation, open workforce training, we're talking about you can't get in a car and drive to school. You can't get in a bus and go to school. There's only one training center in the area, but it's 15 miles from you. And what it would take for you to get there just doesn't work. So do you have the tools that you need. This is an opportunity. We need to 
seize on this. During the pandemic, we had the opportunity to do something about it. We did it. We can do it again now to support the businesses in the county, all these counties. Um, expand uh, virtual learning is basically what we're talking about. So uh, partnering with local universities, um, West Palm Beach Innovative Cities program is one of those that comes out. Um, better utilize Tools, there we go, yeah, that, that already exist in the education systems with industry. Sorry, it was a difficult word. Yeah, it's okay. We'll go, we'll go faster. Um, but truly, we have tools out there. We just need to better utilize them. And again, get them aligned. Make sure the tools are in the hands of the people that need them. Um, so... Uh, simplify, clarify, and linkage between the dollars and the needs. I mean, really, that one sentence says it all, but it's just one way to do it. Expand credentialing based upon industry needs. So there again is the driver, is the business or the industry. But we have to expand the credentialing because just saying that I was educated to do this doesn't mean anything to the employer I'm applying for. So we need to have either locally or nationally recognized credentialing. Threats. Now you might think gig economy as a threat is kind of an odd one, but it is. And it's a threat in a couple of ways. Um, <clears throat> it disincentivize, uh, in, disincentivizes continuing education in many ways. Why should I continue to go to high school when I can get in my car now that I have a driver's license and become an Uber driver. And I can immediately make more money than I'd make as a part-time job. So we've got to watch that. Um, there's a problem with the gig economy as well. And when I speak gig economy, it's a rather large term now. It's not just Uber and Lyft. Uh, contract workers. Contract workers, for instance, uh, we had a big layoff in Palm Beach County of medical workers. I got the warn notice and I dropped out of my chair. How can that possibly be? No, they were becoming contract workers. So we're seeing it in a lot of industries. Kelly pointed out how many new industries are coming here in financial. Guess what? They hire contract workers. So that's a gig worker. Our system of reporting at the federal and state level doesn't quite understand how to deal with gig workers yet. So because they're reporting their wages quarterly, but in turn, you and I or anyone else who's working a regular full-time job, our employer is reporting the wages when they pay the taxes. And they do that on a regular basis through the wages system. So it goes to the state of Florida, comes back. Well, guess what? The IRS is not in Florida. It goes up to you know where, and then you, it's hard to get data back down. Uh, there's all kinds of legal issues. So raising minimum wage, and that's about education as well, because if you're a college and you put someone into a job with a credential and they went out and got that job, but they're working a contract job, they can't prove it. So we, raising minimum wage, that's also a threat right now. It's also an opportunity, but it's a threat. And it's forcing automation in many industries that we never thought we'd see it. Uh, it was said today, the kiosk that we see in McDonald's is not there for the um, customer convenience. They cut out the lowest paid employee at a McDonald's, the person working the cash register. So it's going to come, it's going to come even bigger in many industries. Um, balance with market forces. And again, that's raising the minimum wage. It has to balance with market forces. Remember, supply and demand should drive wage. And that really will happen in the future as we're seeing a smaller and smaller workforce as we go forward. Insufficient career advising. We're talking about career counselors in schools who I think, uh, I don't know if Angela's still in the room. Her description was perfect. You're assigned to counsel a through D, and then someone else picks up E through, you know, 
well, wait a minute, I'm an expert in a certain area, but I've just been assigned an alpha character to do guidance counseling. That has nothing to do with the career I know about. So we need to revisit that with guidance counselors, put more emphasis on that. Because we, if we're going to do that, career advisement is the big selling point for young people. Um, building sound work habits. We talked about soft skills. Again, that's a threat. We don't have that right now. We've got to get those sound work habits. Yes, it should start at home. It should start with mentors. It should start with maybe in your um, community organizations or churches, but it may not happen. It may not happen. Uh, <coughs> sorry. Speed and pace of technology change. We all know Moore's Law. Well, it's probably gotten run over because things are speeding up. And what, again, this is something that I, I always have the argument with, is it a correlation or a causation? In this case, we're talking about COVID. COVID caused an awful lot of things to happen, but in correlation, in many other things, but it really caused employers to move toward automation. And we've seen that. We've seen schools do it. We all were all virtual for a while. Mental health, that's a big one. Um, the drivers, you know, keep focus on uh, open disorders and dr uh, drug abuse. We really need to address that as a threat. What's that? For the sake of time, I'm going to stop and we're just going to go over the SWAT part. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. And that's just projects. Right. Yeah. We'll just so. do the SWAT part. Sorry. Took too long? No, no, no. We just. Perfect. perfect, perfect, perfect. Okay, what group do we have next, Kim? Can you... Okay, that's not infrastructure. Infrastructure and growth relationships. Okay, who's the spokesperson for infrastructure? Who's going to speak for infrastructure? I'll turn for you if you want to just speak. Oh, come on. Oh, good afternoon, Laura Moss, Indian River County Commission, and I have excellent soft skills. I wasn't even supposed to be here today. Yes, my assistant put it on my schedule and forgot to take it off. But I'm so glad I barged in, and this was wonderful. I enjoyed the whole thing. And by the way, you know, the synergy that develops in this room is probably the most important part of it because I made plans today to go forward with some programs working with the uh, Small Business Development Center, Tom Kindred, and thank you to Bank of America for supporting uh, Tom Kindred and the Small Business Development Corporation. So a lot of that is even more important than the ideas that come out of today. And I'm, I'm going to try not to be redundant, but we talked about infrastructure and growth, you know, which is happening to, to all of us. Uh, strengths, we talked about, well, advocacy, we are raising awareness of Lake Okeechobee and water problems, uh, knowledge of energy companies, uh, private utilities, oh, solar, everybody's got solar panels popping up all over the place. We do in Indian River, probably you do, you have solar panels, solar is the way to go. I mentioned uh, tourism as a strength, and w one of the things, the reason why is, um, to, ha, having to do with infrastructure is it forces us to take a look at ourselves. And I'll, I'll speak about Indian River County, but I know you've had this problem south of here too, where you have red tide and that kind of thing. So sometimes, you know, it's like you don't take care of yourself or you don't take care of your house until companies coming over. And tourists are a little bit like that for the state of Florida. We have to make sure our house is in good order or that, no, they're, they're not going to come for dinner. So, and we want them to come for dinner. We want them to visit us. So it kind of holds our feet to the fire in a sense. The other thing um, I'll mention about tourism is, and this appears later in the SWAT, is it's an opportunity in a way, and I, I, this might have to go through Tallahassee, I'm at the county level, but I would love to see some of the uh, tourist tax used to solve some of our infrastructure problems. I mean, we, you know, we, we in Indian River County get a huge amount of, of tourist tax, so I would love to see it used other ways. All right, let me see what else I have here that's not redundant. 
uh, strength, low taxes, and that's the state where definitely uh, roads in pretty good shape. Well, I don't know about uh, my county. I get a lot of complaints. I, by the way, am the queen of potholes. So I had no idea that that was coming, but it did. So uh, good, capital f well, good capital funding. Well, definite maybe on that. All right. Okay, uh, weaknesses. And some of you may experience this, that we have no local match uh, for transit money that comes through. Uh, projects are planned, but uh, local support can be lacking, so it doesn't happen. I don't know, I haven't had that experience myself, but some of the other people in the room had. Uh, see tomorrow through cloud of today. I don't know, I mean, I didn't say some of these things, and I don't, frankly, I don't even know what it means, because I never look through clouds. I always see the bright side of everything, because you might as well, right? What's the point? You know, we've had enough negativity. We've had enough negativity the last two years to last us a lifetime, haven't we? I mean, really? And the naysayers, did they get us anywhere? No. So forget that, you know? <laughs> I didn't say that. Uh, marketing of goals, uh, access. I don't know, you might have to do this, Tom. You, this, these are your notes. Uh, complication of, I'm kidding. Uh, compli oh, complicate. Okay, yes, transit is complicated because this is complication of using transit, and that's true. And we in the group we talked about the fact we don't have. Oh, yes, Brightline is coming. Uh, we know that. And uh, yes, I, I am a commissioner in Indian River, but uh, the city of Vero Beach. I, I was the mayor of Vero Beach. We were never against the train, so we don't we don't have the city had no history of that. The county. I don't know, I don't have any explanation for that, but it's, it was a lot of money and of course the train is coming. That's where the term railroaded comes from, which has been around a very long time. All you needed was a dictionary not to spend $4 million on lawyers. Okay. Uh, transportation, oh, okay, Tra I, I, oh, this is a good point. Transportation lacking in impoverished areas. That, that is a very good point. And something, we, by the way, um, and maybe you can use this in other counties, this is, goes back to the synergy thing I was talking about. We have what is called a go line, and that is free. And it actually goes everywhere in the county. So you can get on and off as you wish. We have a marina, and people come in by sailboat, and they hop on, and you know they'll go to the restaurant area, and use, you know, go to a restaurant, come back. So that's, that's a really good way to go. It kind of, in a sense, you know, quotes pays for itself. All right, I'm moving on. How am I doing on time? All right, I can talk fast. I can talk faster, don't worry. Uh, oh, opportunities, I mentioned the tour. I would love to see that tourism revenue used for other things. Uh, oh, we talked, that's right, we talked about uh, the tax on uh, gas, gasoline, and not as, you know, the price of gasoline going up and maybe get rid of that tax, but people are using less, less gas anyway. I mean, it already was happening with the electric cars and that kind of thing, and we've seen it in our county, but you know, hey folks, guess what? If, if you don't get money one way, you're gonna get it another. So they're just gonna change the name of it and take it from somewhere else, but it's not gonna, you know, if you wanna reduce the level of taxes, that's a lot bigger conversation than where exactly where it's coming from. It doesn't matter. It's the total, you have to come up with the total. All right, uh, oh yeah, toll roads. That's another way to get it, if you don't get it from gas. I talked about, um, oh yes, uh, this, and this was actually an interesting suggestion. Talked about um, having a ferry, and that was here, uh, in Southern, uh, you know, a little farther south. This was not in New River County. We don't, we don't have or need a ferry. But they talked about, I think it was, that was from, what, Palm Beach Gardens to, uh, to Palm Beach? West Palm Beach, thank you, thank you, Tom. Um, okay, partnerships. Uh, I think we're okay with this. We have lots of opportunities here. We already know that. All right, threats, also known as challenges. This is the biggest threat, I know, and I, I, I'm gonna take a second to talk about this. We don't know, you know, we're so focused on the lagoon and the quality of water and Okeechobee and, and all that quality of water. We need to very seriously think about the quantity of water, okay? My county, I'm trying to have the 1988 
geohydrologic study updated. Yes, 1988. And believe it or not, I'm getting a hard time about that. Yes, which is really difficult for me to believe, but it's true. I mean, we, since 1988, my county, Indy River, has gone from 60,000 people to 160,000 people. We need to know about the quantity of water. I mean, we, why? Because we're entering this phase of development. We all know that. We see everybody coming in. Well, do we have the water to sustain that? I mean, that's, water is the most basic infrastructure. Okay, I mean, think about, think about the term infrastructure because everything's based on water. If you don't have enough water, it ain't gonna happen. It's just not. And what's the other most basic form of infrastructure? Okay, so that's the tangible. Water's the tangible infrastructure. The most basic, to me, my opinion, most basic intangible, intangible infrastructure is what? Sense of community. And that's the other issue that I think personally and, and politically for me, for my county as an elected official, I need to be careful. We need to preserve our sense of community. And that's, you know, our, our towns, our villages, our cities. By and large, yes, we, you know, we, we're addressing their problems, but we, we love them. We love them the way they are. We're fixing them, but we love them the way we are. And we, and we all know it. We have a huge influx of people coming in. So those are the two things. Water, intangible infrastructure, sense of community, intangible infrastructure. And what do we do about each of those? And we really need to be very, very careful because I, I think especially with the intangible, because when you have sense of community destroyed, how do you fix that? How do you fix that? I think that's the worst problem you can have, is loss of sense of community. And I, I, you know, I, I, I truly believe that, and that's something we we'll have to be very careful about going forward. And I'll just see if there's anything else here. And I think we're set. Is that five minutes? Good, good, excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, next we have innovation and economic development. And the most dynamic, terrific speaker of the day is Sarah. I owe her a lot. I owe her lots and lots today. So. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Maxfield. I'm the economic development director for the city of Delray Beach. Very happy to be here. Our group did things a little bit differently. We were a little more freeform, um, brainstorming, just yelling out what we felt like were the strengths. Um, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats for innovation and economic development. So some of these things, as often happens during exercises um, like this, is that a lot of these um, things that we have listed here actually appear on, on multiple pages. Um, and so that comes from the beauty of the interdisciplinary group we had and our different perspectives and, and how we work. So some of our strengths that we saw for innovation and economic development was the growing population here. That's always important when you're talking about economic development and projects coming in. Uh, tourism and ecotourism, um, the agriculture, our talent pool, diversity, the climate here and the weather, obviously, the tax um, environment here, our vibrant small business environment, the many educational opportunities that we have in the Treasure Coast region and a safe place to live. Um, also, so there's still room for land development, infrastructure, and there's access to transportation. Weaknesses, climate change, sea level rise, limited access to capital, low wages, education, transportation. There's a theme here. Skills gap, affordable housing, we all know that's a major issue facing us. Limited infrastructure. Uh, water quality, the high cost of living. Um, I don't know what's happened in all of your communities, but in Delray Beach, we're 20.2% higher than the national average when it comes to cost of living. Um, that's not exactly where we want to be, and it's still rising. Um, wealth gap, access to health care, minority business, lack of access to social networks, property taxes, difficulty getting through the permitting process, Lack of community education, 
on government and civics and how things work and what the processes are, and better communication on opportunities. We all felt that there was room for improvement for, for all of our partners, governmental, private entities, to communicate a little bit better what's going on, because there may be great efforts happening in these directions, but we just don't know that they're happening. Opportunities, uh, ecotourism, green industries, blue economy, networking, the education skills, training with needs, creating pathways for careers, sports tourism, space industry, supporting the businesses, enhancing trade relations with the Caribbean and other international communities, ex expanding businesses in the glades, recreational amenities, improving healthcare systems, location, 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 Improving transportation networks, multimodal, TODs, expand east-west connectors, better communication on existing efforts, with the climate change uh, becoming a leader in resiliency. And we have our threats. Tourism. I know that's a weird one. That was mine. Um, but as I said to my group, just stay with me here for a moment. Um, tourism is a great thing. Some of our communities have maybe hit that point. Um, the residents are starting to not like all the tourism that's coming in. Um, the residents can't find dinner reservations at their favorite restaurants. The residents can't afford to move into the home they want to move into because of all the tourism that's happening. The traffic that's occurring, the um, focus on tourism as our one and only economic driver also is deeply connected to our low-wage jobs and the fact that many of our citizens can't afford to live where they work. Um, tourism impacts the local, the community, uh, unintentional consequences. Not enough diversity in industry. The way we think about development, mixed use affordability. I don't remember what that was. Lack of affordable housing, shrinking working class, not enough high paying jobs, loss of agricultural industry, climate change, uh, sea level rise, Hurricanes and other natural disasters. Infra trans HPTO fiber. Okay. Infrastructure, transportation, water, and fiber. Did I get it? Okay. Sprawl and pollution. That's it. All right. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Okay, it looks like we have economic resilience coming up. I'll take this part of it. I don't think they need that. Well, you guys worked really hard. You just beat the materials. Just your, your SWAT. You want to? Okay. We're not going to go through all this. Hang on to this. Oh, you've got a summary? Okay, that's perfect. Yeah. So, yeah. Sherry doesn't. Here you go. Uh, Your summary is she doesn't step yeah, hands? Yeah, that's what I need. Just this. Yes. Okay. So, how do we put this? Here, Kim, you get that one. Okay. So, I was the one that walked out of the room, so I was voted to speak today. <laughs> <laughs> I tried for a revote, but I didn't get it. So we went through our SWOT analysis like everybody else did, and as you know, I see from listening to others, we all came up with some very common threads in our SWOT analysis. Um, and I was a little nervous I was ha gonna have to read eight sheets of paper, but we're gonna narrow it down to our objectives and actions, and some of them we kept, some of them we modified, and some of them we added on. So if you uh, go through what we have here, um, our objective was to establish a diverse regional economy with financially sound, and we only had local governments before, but we're going to say business and local governments, able to withstand, prevent, and quickly recover from major disruptions to its underlying economic base and effectively deal with natural and man-made disasters. 
investors. So that was our first one. So we just did a slight modification. I think if we've learned one thing through the pandemic, it's that public-private partnerships are very important. Uh, the first action we modified to say support the continued diversification of business and industry throughout the region, including business incubator uh, programs uh, in Palm Beach County, for instance. We know that 98% of the businesses have 25 or less employees. 93% of the businesses have five or less employees. So this is really important to us to make sure that we focus on these small businesses. So we want to have these business incubator programs because we also found out through our Restart Business Program that people don't know how to file their taxes, they don't know what licenses they need, and so we want to support these businesses that are so busy running their businesses, they don't have time to figure out what they should be doing in order to be as successful as possible. Action two, uh, we just added, uh, actually we kept it the same, support industries where regions' unique attributes are compelling, including agriculture and marine industries. And when we talked about marine industries, we even talked about transportation and how that can help to alleviate transportation. Um, you know, the waterways are actually, uh, you know, are eligible for federal grants, so maybe we can kind of tap into those, get some ferry systems, get some water taxis, so that we can tr um, have better transportation that way, and a nice ride to work. Um, so, uh, number three, complete work underway on Everglades restoration and repair of the Her Herbert Hoover Dyke and protection of our near shore Atlantic coastal reef systems. We didn't make any changes to that. I think we all think that's important. Uh, action four, identify diverse revenue sources for government. Um, uh, which are tied to uh, trailing and leading economic activity. Most importantly, we heard this from other people, access to capital. I know in Palm Beach County, we have a number of loan programs that we um, access through federal resources. We have about a $45 million loan fund that we, that we utilize to help specifically pretty much small businesses. Um, and then uh, we identify, um, oh, we took out number five because we thought number five and number six were really kind of repetitive. So ensure local government reserves are adequate to operate and begin recovery from disaster without immediate outside resources. And we blended it and meet GFO, GFOA uh, recommendations. And so we, and so what that does is it encourages businesses to have adequate reserves. And we did have an elected official in our, uh, in our group and uh, we did talk about how that is challenging. Kim uh, was talking about that. And we do know that choices have to be made and sometimes whether it's encouraging, you know, or, or improving the trash pickup or putting money in the reserves, you know, it, it, it depends on what you're hearing from your constituents and what, you know, what they, the choices that you have to make in the end. But we all know that that's important. Um, ensure capital expenditure investments of government and the private sector uh, consider the effect of sea level ri rise related to design, location, and resiliency. That speaks for itself. We all have our climate change compacts that we're looking at and other things uh, that we're making improvements to and new work groups. Um, and then create local government, nonprofit, and private sector resilience, adaption, and business community plans that will result in faster recovery from inter, uh, interruptions from future events. Um, and so we also tagged on three additional um, objectives or actions. Uh, one is coordination among different groups and industries to solve problems, public-private partnerships. We know that's, in, that's important, including, um, and then have rapid response training to meet workforce needs for disaster recovery. We saw that. We, we talked a lot in our group about how a lot of the industries actually had to pivot and start doing something else. You know, they were making, you know, there was airlines that were, uh, or uh, airplane manufacturers that were making face shields. We had a cosmetic manufacturer that was making um, hand sanitizer. So there has to be that rapid response to pivot if you need to, and also to have the workforce training to train the people how to do what you're going to pivot to. So that's important. And then lastly, ensure economic recovery uh, plans are maintained and updated regularly. And we did this with ours uh, through the pandemic because most of our, econo our economic recovery plans are due to weather disasters. We think of hurricanes or floods or things of that nature. This pandemic brought us a whole new thing and we had to, to take a really fresh look at everything that we're doing. So that is our summary of economic resilience. Thank you. 
you. Okay, so thank you, Sherry. Another SEDS member. Um, next, we've got quality of life, quality places. Okay. Yeah. Here, I'll just kind of stand here. I'll have to step on me to walk off. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Ooh, that was low. Let me try that one more time. Good afternoon, everyone. All right, so I, I'm going to kind of start how we started. Jennifer, thank you for the idea. I'm going to start with our threats and then work our way back to our strengths. Uh, we had a pretty good uh, conversation. I'm not going to read everything uh, that's here, but you'll, you'll have an opportunity to kind of see as I go through. Uh, but one of the threats we talked about initially dealt with the pandemic and the impact that the pandemic had on uh, our quality of life, quality, quality of place. Um, we also know we live in South Florida, so you have to do in Florida in general, so you have to deal with hurricanes. Housing was a big topic of discussion within our group uh, and some of the issues related to housing and some of the issues related to employment and homelessness, not just housing at the higher levels, but all the way from homelessness on up. Cultural awareness, uh, just the education and the skills and things that are lacking and missing as it relates to that. Jumping down a little bit, we talked about climate and the impact that climate has had here. And then politics, politics, changing politics and how those things impact our quality of life and quality of place. Opportunities. Uh, every municipality has received ARPA. You have an opportunity to be creative in how you use your American Rescue Plan dollars to impact the, the community. Uh, we talked about, uh, one, one of the conversations came up about uh, Knight Foundation and a grant that came out uh, that could help in some areas. So that's, that's another opportunity. Uh, building in the in-town and downtown areas. Uh, comments about updating our impact fees and, and the impact that could have within what we're doing. Um, and then we talked about a little bit about the regional transit as an opportunity, working together to do some of those things. Weaknesses. Everybody's, again, talked about it so much, uh, housing and the affordability issues, uh, cash buyers that we have coming in and how that's impacting those that are able to secure mortgages but still not able to buy. Um, you know, homelessness. I mean, that's continued to be a big issue and it's going to continue to be a big issue until plans are put in place at a municipal level and the uh, city and county levels to address that. Uh, and then we talked about some other things that you can see here. Uh, Jennifer, thank you for writing all this down. I can't read it all, but thank you. Appreciate it. All right. And then we're going to end with our strengths. Um, regional collaboration. Uh, the fact that th there is a Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council and they, the municipalities and counties can collaborate is a major plus. Uh, we talked about what we have to offer again in, in Florida. This is a place that a lot of people want to come. We're desirous, uh, an area that's desired. So uh, from our public parks to our waterways, um, you know, people want to come here. People want to be here. Um, despite the fact that we have hurricanes, we have great weather typically uh, year round. So we are, again, desirable public access. Uh, to our waterways. Diversity um, is a strength that we have here. Um, and uh, tourism, branding, uh, and, and agriculture. And so those were our strengths for the most part. Any questions? None? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, one more, Kim. We have civic and governance systems. Mayor Shore, can you do this one? All right, Mayor Shore, Robert Shore, Loxatchee Groves. We wrote these nice and big and neat, so I could just play Vanna White. And anybody got any questions? <laughs> All right, I'll just try to hit on some things that I haven't heard. Most of them everybody's talked about. Quality of life, strengths, uh, philanthropy. Um, I know Palm Beach County, you know, South Florida, there's a lot of money out there. Try to keep it in your area. Try to keep it here on the Treasure Coast. You know, build those relationships. 
and get them to invest in our communities. Somebody talked about a $200 million investment recently locally here somewhere, so. I could read this when she wrote it. <laughs> um, the medical field, uh, I don't think it's been mentioned yet. Uh, that's become a strength. It was interesting looking at the things in 2017 that in the last five years, you know, a lot of new stuff's come. All right, let's find some more that I can read here. <laughs> I really could read it when she wrote them perfectly. We talked about them. All right, weaknesses, uh, transportation, workforce housing, uh, environmental degradation due to growth. You know, all this growth that's coming in, um, it was pretty steady throughout the years. And now all of a sudden it's huge and it, it's having a huge impact on our infrastructure and everything and, and how do you catch up? Because it hit us. So the weaknesses is, uh, you know, we didn't plan for it and it's here. So how do we take care of it? Water quality. You can see? Yeah. I really could just play Vanna White. Um, yeah. Threats. Here's one that I haven't heard. Misinformation, fake news, leads to mistrust of government. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I just went through one hell of an election, and I won by 10 votes, and I should have won by 100 votes for all the great things that we did, but due to these things, people that don't know me were influenced by this stuff. So it, it leads to mistrust, it leads to new people in office that maybe shouldn't be there, Maybe they're there for the wrong reasons, but it's definitely a, a continuous threat that five years ago I don't think was here, right? You know, in 2017, it wasn't here. Now, it, it's huge. It has a huge impact. Uh, political malcontent, civil unrest. Yes. Yes, and there's the rapid growth again. I see galloping technology. There it is. Yeah. Natural man-made disasters, pandemics into endemic, in the cycle we had arrows going back and forth. You know what's going to happen next? I mean, it, it, it's a yeah, it, it's a vicious circle, and will it end? Because a whole new industry is built around it now. Um, whole new uh, publications, ways of communication, you know, that, that may be true, may not be true. So it's uh, definitely a threat to determine what's real, what's not. And uh, opportunities, as I said earlier, there's tons of opportunities. We're in South Florida, and we have all these people coming down, so... We have great opportunities to do great things. We've got a, a lot of people coming to our area because now they can work from home. So do I want to work from home sitting up in the cold? Or do I want to do it in sunny South Florida? And let's go to South Florida. So these are people coming here from, for a different reason than in the past. You know, a lot of people came here to retire, you know, to play golf, shuffleboard. You know, now these are you know, high-level professionals, you know, that can work from home. So it's a totally different demographic for a different reason. So an opportunity to capitalize on 
when they do finally leave the home, you know, taking advantage of their expertise, their talents, their experience, getting them involved in the community. Um, somebody said earlier, what, 45% of them coming from New York. So, you know, will that create a new demographic? You know, in the old days, like Seinfeld, right? To Boca Raton, everybody from New York to Boca, following Jerry's parents. So, um, opportunities for workforce, skill development. We had some great talks earlier on what uh, the colleges are doing. Um, we've got, uh, and Kelly didn't talk about it today, it was at the League of Cities meeting the other day, the University of Florida, I think, is building a um, inner city garden complex in West Palm Beach where they're going to be growing a bunch of stuff, and I don't want to say too much because I'm probably going down the wrong road, but Kelly had a, a great story on um, the universities getting together and doing that, and there was another university initiative down there. They're teaming up, so, um, you know, bringing Gainesville down to Palm Beach County, other than IFAS. We've always had them out there for Belle Glade, Fort Pierce. We've always had IFAS, and now they're coming for other reasons. Uh, there's philanthropy again with opportunities. And lots of opportunities for infrastructure improvement. And there's the AI and technology and IT. So that is it. Thank you. Wow, that was great. I think you guys can see that's one of the things we always do on Charette is you always come back so that the groups can see what what kind of things do we all have in common? What kind of things, you know, uh, didn't we think of? You know, it kind of sparks ideas that maybe you didn't talk about in your group. So it's always good to come back together and, and talk about what was talked in, in the other groups because we can't all be in seven places at one time. So um, is, does anybody wish to make public comment? No? Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, and um, now, Tom Lanahan, our executive director, is going to wrap up the day for us. I just want to kind of make a little, let everybody know that Tom's, what, sixth day at the Regional Planning Council <laughs> was this regional summit five years ago. So yep. here we are. Yeah. So, yeah. So. So, it, yeah, it's not, so it's great, great to be uh, uh, here doing this again. Um, so a couple of things I wanted to mention. I have a few notes here, so I, let me move over here. Um, so just to uh, summarize a little bit, um, so the first thing, thank you. Thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you all uh, who are uh, still here for uh, staying through the breakout groups and then the presentations. Um, we really appreciate it. Uh, your, your feedback, your input um, is what we need to have a good comprehensive economic development strategy for our, our entire region. Um, going a, a couple of points to, um, to remember, uh, right, we've been here all day, um, so a few things that resonated uh, with me along the way. Um, Dr. Moore talked about that um, we need to innovate or lose, right? Uh, Greg Vade talked about um, uh, that our assets are the beginning of the conversation. It's not the end of the conversation, it's the beginning of the conversation about our economic development strategy. Uh, David Gillespie mentioned, uh, and uh, I, I strongly support this uh, shout out, uh, www.thefloridascorecard.org. Um, check it out. Uh, it is full of information uh, specific down to um, at least the county level uh, on all the different uh, pillars, uh, and they keep it up, up to date. It is, it is constantly updated. It's a great, great, great tool. Those guys are full of data uh, there. Um, and then we had uh, another thing we learned in his presentation, $1.3 million in W-2 reported income coming to new into Florida every hour, every hour. We got to seize that opportunity right there. Um, and that there's a void of information between employers and job seekers and between students and job opportunities. I thought that was, that was uh, uh, very impactful uh, to us. So the educational panel. I, we heard about skill set and will set. That was a new, that's a new term uh, that, that I heard today. So that's, you know, uh, your, uh, your will to get out there uh, and do these things. 
Uh, remote learning has caused us to have additional shortfalls in soft skills. Uh, that was interesting. Uh, problem solving uh, and learning skills to put knowledge to use. That's, that's what our, our students need in our, our new work workplace. And never stop learning, right? Um, so in the, um, and then also uh, uh, we had, uh, in the trades area, 95% uh, of the graduates are, that came out of those programs are still working in uh, trade programs. That's, that's pretty interesting. Uh, that, that tells you that the, uh, the training uh, stuck. Um, the Innovation Economic Development Panel, a couple of highlights again. Uh, shrinking competitive advantage uh, in Florida, right? Our, our, we're no longer just the cheap place to go and do business. Uh, that, so we need to accentuate those other assets that we have, uh, uh, get the rest of those messages out. Uh, and then we need good infrastructure for moving people, goods, and information. And, in, and interesting, and this would go in the opportunities and threats, I guess, board, um, some concern that once St. Lucie County gets uh, more jobs, uh, as is their goal, will the workers still go down to Palm Beach County to work in those jobs? And I, th I thought that was, that was interesting. Um, and then look in, in you know, it, it related also to transportation. The train plus the scooter plus a shuttle, uh, those sorts of things for, for getting around um, w without needing uh, an individual car. Uh, in the policy area, uh, address general, generational poverty and child welfare issues, that, that these are a drag on uh, our economic prosper prosperity. Uh, and that in the development community, the three issues is time, cost, and uncertainty. And the different pillars, I think, each address uh, some of those different things. So those are uh, some of the things just reminding, because we just did the SWAT stuff, a little reminders about some of the things that we heard in the, in the first part of the day. Uh, think about those as you um, leave here today. Um, and I want to um, just wrap up again with a, with a thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Stephanie Height, for putting this day on for us uh, today. Fantastic job. And uh, thank you to the rest of the um, Regional Planning Council staff who, uh, who also worked hard putting this together, but Stephanie was the captain of the ship today. Uh, thank you, Indian River State College, for being a fantastic host uh, for us. And thank you, SEDS committee members, for all that you do and all that you're going to do uh, with all of this information. Uh, re help us rewrite that plan. So uh, thank you all very much. Have a great uh, weekend.